to dental. So before we start looking at question three in detail, I just want to perhaps spend a little bit of time talking about the history of this statement. So it's a little bit of a history lesson and also then the, the philosophy behind the statement of cash flows. So I'm just going to scroll down uh, to the statement of cash flows. Uh, oops, there I've again accidentally clicked on my outlook. I don't want that open because then there's all sorts of noises. Uh, so I'm just going to scroll down to the statement of cash flows itself, which is the answer. Um, there we can see, um, as Mr. Borman pointed out last, there are four distinct sections on the face of this statement of cash flows. The first dealing with the operating activities, right? So there we've got a section dealing with operating activities. We've got a section dealing with investing activities. We go down a little bit more, we've got a section dealing with financing activities. And then the fourth and final section is a reconciliation between our opening or beginning of the year cash and cash equivalents with the cash and cash equivalents at the end of the year. Uh, and that clearly will indicate either an increase or a decrease in our cash and cash equivalent during the course of the year. Now, uh, interestingly enough, if we talk about the history of this statement, originally this statement had a different name. It was called the Statement of Source and Application of Funds, which is quite a mouthful. So originally it was called the Statement of Source and Application of Funds, uh, and the name was changed to the Statement of Cash Flows about 30 years ago, around about 1990. So it's, it's been a cash flow for a long time. Anyway, why, why I'm just pointing out the, the, uh, the history of this statement, originally, originally the statement of source and application of funds did have this section, this section here. We very often refer to that as the operations section. We know that that overall activity deals with operating activities, but these three lines here, these three lines, that those three lines deal with our operations. So that is why it's called cash generated from operations. Now, if we have a look at what we now today know as the note to the statement of cash flows, uh, we also see that this note ends with that same description, cash generated from operations. Now, in the old statement of source and application of funds, your operations section was this, what we now today call the note. Right, so this was the, the, the way that in the statement of source and application of funds, how the operations section was detailed. Since the name has been changed to the statement of cash flows, what has happened since is that IAS 7, which deals with the statement of cash flows, as distinguished between a cash flow statement or a statement of cash flows on the direct method and a statement of cash flows on the indirect method. Now, if you have been required to draw up the statement of uh, cash flows on the indirect method, which we are not doing, but I'm just indicating that, in this, this, this part from profit for the year before tax, until where it ends here in cash generated from operations, that is how you would have indicated your operations section, this section, uh, on the face of your statement of cash flows. Right. But nowadays, this is the modern trend. For, for about the last 25 or 30 years, the modern trend is to rather indicate the, the, the operations section in accordance with the direct method. Right. All the other sections, whether you are using the indirect method or the direct method, your, your investing activities, your financing activities, your, uh, the reconciliation of the opening and closing cash flows or, or cash and cash equivalents would have been identical. So the only difference between the direct method and the indirect method is how you indicate the operations. So how things have been developing over the last uh, 25 or so years, and this is the practice now, and probably the case of 90 or 99% of companies, they do a little bit of both. <laughs> if I say they do a little bit of both, 
is they draw up the main statement, the statement of cash flows or, or the face of the statement of cash flows like this, which is the direct method. And then they just count uh, until the end of the statement. And then they go and disclose just the operations section where it ends with cash generated from operations. They also go and show it uh, according according to the indirect method, but now we don't have a, call it a separate state. It is just a note, right? So this is just a note to the statement of cash flows that indicate the operations part on the indirect method. Okay, so that is just a little bit of a, of a history lesson. So I guess there shouldn't be any questions from you at this stage. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so we know in financial accounting too, in order to determine the cash generated from operations, we first of all have to go and do the note. In financial accounting three, we are going to go a little bit further and then we'll, we'll also teach you a method how you get, can go and calculate the cash paid to suppliers and employees by reconstructing the, the, the creditors account and the inventory account and all your expense accounts and so forth. But that would be for financial accounting three. So how we do, how we go about this in financial accounting two, we are first going to calculate that part by doing the note and then we are going to uh, calculate the cash receipts from customers and then that figure the cash paid to suppliers and employees like mr Bormann said last week will simply be the balancing figure the difference between those two okay ladies and gents again still a little bit with the philosophy with the philosophy of the statement of cash flows there have been many interpretations over the years um there was there was a stage up till about 10 15 years where this where, where, where these adjustments were actually disclosed under little subheadings called um, uh, items shown on the main statement and items not involving the flow of funds and so forth uh, over the last probably 10 years the last decade or so it has been done away with because there's now a sort of a, a slightly different philosophy when it comes to the statement of cash flows so how we go about this, ladies and gentlemen, is to figure out what this note actually entails. What this note entails. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, talk us through that, and then I'll give you an opportunity to to ask some questions. But you are most welcome to already uh, ask questions if you have any. We can see this note. It starts with profit before tax. Now we know that profit before tax is a figure and a description that we find on the face of our statement of comprehensive income. You all agree with that. Perhaps you can just say, thanks, Sitemele. You can just say yes or no. You agree. Profit before tax comes from the face of our statement of comprehensive income. Yes or no? Yes, thank you, Sitemele. Thank you, Ms. Amasi. Okay, so that comes from the statement of uh, comprehensive income. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what we have to understand very clearly here is that your statement of comprehensive, in, in fact, all the other four statements besides the statement of cash flows, all your other financial statements, the statement of comprehensive income, the statement of changes in equity, the statement of financial position, uh, the notes to the financial statements, uh, all of them are being drawn up using which system which system that we spoke about when we discussed the conceptual framework as well as when we discussed the IAS one those four statements they 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 use which system to draw up financial statements what do we call that system does anybody have a clue there Yes, there, Mrs. Moore gives you a good clue. It starts with the letter A. The A what? What system? Mm, looks like some of you may have forgotten. The accrual system. A-C-C-R-U-A-L. Accrual. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, Dale. The accrual system. Now, you remember the accrual system? Uh, the, 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 the definition of the 
whole system is that expenses and uh, income and liabilities and so forth uh, they get recognized when the when when the item that element complies with the definition and the recognition criteria but we also said that there's an easier way to describe it the easy way to describe it is that incomes and expenses are recorded when they occur on the date that they take place not necessarily when somebody pays the money for it for instance if you have a credit sale in your uh, today if you have a credit sale today you're going to 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 record that credit sale today even though that debtor uh, may only pay you in a month or 60 days time that is basically the accrual system in action the fact that you are crediting your sales account today and you are debiting debtors means you are accruing debt right the fact that you are debiting debtors uh, means you are accruing the debt right so the the fact that I want to point out here is that that figure, uh, let's go back to my word, that the profit for the year before tax or just profit before tax, if you wish, that comes from the statement of comprehensive income and that has been drawn up using the accrual system. So clearly, ladies and gents, that cannot represent a flow of cash. We have to go and convert that to a flow of cash. Now, in the process of converting it to a flow of cash, there are basically two overall steps. And here, I guess it's a good time for you to make a few notes. Please, if you've got a pen or pencil handy and a piece of paper or preferably a notebook, just make a few notes there. There are two overall processes that we have to apply here in order to convert that to a cash flow. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we don't only want to convert it to a cash flow. We want to convert it to a very specific kind of cash flow, namely that we want to, we want to convert it to something called cash generated from operations, which means, ladies and gentlemen, two things. First of all, now it's going to be a cash flow, right? So we've got to convert it to cash. Secondly, it must only deal with items that relate to our operations. Now, if we have a look at the direct method on the face of the statement of uh, cash flows, we see that the operations consist overall of two kinds of things. Your wheelings and dealings with your customers, in other words, the cash received from the customers, and your wheelings and dealings with your suppliers and employees in other words the cash paid to the suppliers which are your suppliers mr Borman pointed that out last week already the suppliers of your inventory for instance but also the supplier of any other services such as your telephone services or your internet services or the supplier of printing st uh, services stationery and so forth and also the amounts you pay to your employees so the operations only deal with what you receive from your customers and what you pay to your suppliers and employees so if we go back to this note we should now understand that included in this profit before tax included in this profit before tax for the year could be items that deal with so-called other operating activities items such as interest uh, uh, expense these are the cash flows we'll talk about the difference between cash flows and expenses and incomes just now so those items uh, the interest paid the interest received the dividends paid the income tax paid please just maybe add there there's not one in this case but another possibility is dividends received right so the five possibilities that we see as so-called other operating expenses would be interest paid interest received dividends received, dividends paid, and income tax paid. They are part of our operating activity section, right? So they are part of the operating activity section, but they are not part of the operations. Only those two items, only those two items are part of the operations. Okay, ladies and gents, so what that means, when we look at this for the, for the year, before tax for the year 
it means that it is possible that they could be expense items or income items. Now, now, now we must be careful. When we talk about the face of the statement of cash flows, we only talk about cash flows. In other words, money, money flowing out of the company or money flowing into the company. But here, when we start off with a profit for a year, it means we have to make some adjustment, not for cash flows, but for expenses or income items that are included there. Income or expense items that are included in the profit before tax, but that do not form part of the operations. So, ladies and gentlemen, that means it can be one of three possibilities. We'll see a little bit later. It's actually only our two. But, uh, if you look at it perhaps more holistically, there can only be three possibilities. The three possibilities is that there could be incomes or expenses like these. These, these are the, the, the cash flow related, the cash flows related to those expenses and income. Uh, that do not form part of the operations, but they are included in your profit. Or, ladies and gentlemen, it could be income or expense items that are part of your investing activities. So clearly that cannot be part of your operations either. Or the third possibility is that it could include income or expenses that deal with your financing activities. I can give you a little secret here. There will normally be no financing activity, income, or expenses in your in your uh, profit before tax, right? Uh, so what we are basically going to be focusing on is eliminating expenses and income that relate to these items, and uh, income and expenses that relate to investing activities. Okay, ladies and gents. So that is that is the introduction. That is the philosophy behind it. Now, uh, perhaps we can just complete the philosophy here. So the first kind of adjustment that we are going to make when we start with a profit before tax, we are going to take out. We are going to take out any expense or any income that does not relate to operations. Right? Let me maybe just repeat that. I know that you can listen to the recording um, again and again and again, but I'm just going to say that once more. Uh, so your first kind of adjustment is to take, uh, when you start with a profit before tax for the year, is to take out any income or any expense that does not relate to the operations. Right? Now I'm going to ask you my first trick question of the day, ladies and gentlemen, because I'm always interested to hear your opinions. Once you have taken out those income and expense items that do not relate to your uh, operations, are you then, the, 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 once you've done that, have you already converted it to a cash flow or is it still a profit or loss at that stage once you've taken out items that do not relate to operations have you now just you can just type yes or no have you then already converted it to a cash flow yes or no have you then converted it, it into a cash flow yet Nobody wants to stick their neck out on this one. Thank you, Dale. You are 100% correct. You haven't converted it. Thank you, Sitimbela. Exactly. You haven't converted it to a cash flow yet. All you've done now is to convert it to either a profit or a loss, but a profit or loss that exclude anything to do with your financing activities or your uh, uh, investing activities and so forth. So therefore, we normally have a little sub a subtotal here, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to type it in there. I see it isn't there. So we're going to call that an operating profit. An operating profit. Remember, now it's not a net profit anymore. It's not a profit before tax anymore. Now it. Now once we've eliminated the items uh, uh, that deal with with with, with uh, operations 
It means it is still a profit or a loss, but it purely relates to your operation. So we're going to call that our operating profit before the changes in working capital. And then we're going to have a little subtotal there. Perhaps if you can just add that up for me, ladies and gents. Um, I haven't got a calculator with me. So your operating profit, uh, th that will be 288491. The profit before tax, less. Is that now a positive or a negative? It's, uh, we'll have to add that up. Please, can you add up for me just what's in that block? What's in that block and see if that, that is then a positive or a negative, if you can do that for me. I should have done this beforehand. I didn't notice. And to cheat a little bit here, yeah, I'm going to work from the bottom upwards. So 343080. I found a calculator now at last. Plus 24720. 367800. 367800. So no, that doesn't make sense, does it? Have you added it up for me, ladies and gents? I'll just have to add it all up. So it is 54,000 uh, minus 35,000 minus 6225 plus 68134. Minus 1,600, that gives us That's a positive, so as 79309 plus 288491, then gives us 367800, which I cheated a little bit. I went backwards and, and added it up there. Anyway, so we've made a little, a few adjustments there. Okay, ladies and gents, so now we've got an operating profit before changes in working capital, right? So that means we've eliminated any income and any expense that does not relate to operations. So we're still sitting with a profit, or if that had been a negative, we would have been sitting with a, with a, with a loss, operating loss. But now, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to still go and convert it. We've still got to go and convert it to a cash flow. So what we have to do now, now we have to go and eliminate the effects of the accrual system, right? Because we've 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 drawn up the, the financial statements, the other financial statements on the accrual system. So now we've got to go and eliminate the effect of the accrual system. So if we are going to eliminate the effect of the accrual system, ladies and gentlemen, we are only talking about the operations. So we are only talking about items that are included our dealings with the customers and we are talking about the items that we are dealing with in terms of our supplies and employees. So there can only there can only be three kinds of assets that would have increased or decreased from the beginning of the year as a result of the accrual system. What are those three items? There are various names you can call it. But what are the three items? The three assets or liabilities are all current assets or current liabilities that where we accrue sales to customers on or where we accrue purchases from our, our, our suppliers and employees. 
What are those three? What are those three? You can type them for me there. What are the three accounts where we actually accrue? Let, let's start with the first one. On which account do we accrue our credit sales? On which account do we accrue our credit sales? It is our debtors account, right? Our debtors account. That is where. Thank you. Deba, thank you. Also, Anil, Anwar, trade receivables or debtors control are all correct. Correct. That is where we accrue it on. So that means in order to go and convert that, that operating profit to a cash flow, it means we'll have to go and eliminate the accrual system on that. Where, on which account? Let's assume we are using the, the uh, perpetual inventory account. On which account do we record the movements of our inventory? If you can type that for me as well. On which account do we record the movement of inventory? That is actually a giveaway. On which account? The inventory account, right? The inventory account. And then on which account do we accrue the credit purchases? Thank you, Jose. The inventory account and on which account do we accrue our credit purchases? Trade payables, thank you, Anil. Trade payables or creditors, if you want to uh, use a very simple little name, trade payables. Thank you, Mzimasi and Jose. All of you are correct, right? So that is where the accrual the accruals take place. So, ladies and gentlemen, in order to go and convert, let me just go to that note again. In order to convert this figure, the operating profit, before changes in working capital to, to, to convert that profit into a cash flow, we will have to see by how much our inventories, our trade and other receivables, and our trade and other payables have either decreased or increased during the course of the year because that would that would indicate or that would represent an increase in the accrual or a decrease in the accrual of either inventory or debtors or creditors okay anyway so that is basically the philosophy and the idea and the and the theory behind the statement and a little bit of history thrown in there okay so now let's actually start with the question itself so we're going to go have a look what is required of us i don't think there will be any surprises required section states simply we must drop the statement of cash flows for the year of september 2020 so there we've got very good and very handy information. We see that the financial year end of this company is the 30th of September. So we've got to draw up that statement of cash flow. Secondly, we've got to draw up the note to reconcile the net profit before ca uh, tax with cash generated from operations. In other words, that note, uh, which basically is similar to the operations part, if you had been doing it on the indirect method. Okay, so there we know we've got to convert a figure that has been calculated on the accrual system. We've got to eliminate anything that's included in there that doesn't deal with operations. And then lastly, we've got to convert to a flow of cash. Okay, ladies and gents, so now let's go and have a look. What do they provide us? And we see there's actually a lot of information here. There's a statement of financial position. We see that this company has property, they've got equipment, they provide us with the cost of the equipment, as well as the accumulated depreciation on the equipment. They provide us with vehicles, or the company owns vehicles, and they provide us with a cost account, as well as the accumulated depreciation account for vehicles. You also see that the company has some investments, or financial assets. Uh, and then we've got the current assets. We see there there's uh, inventory, accounts receivable. Interestingly, here yeah, is also current tax refundable income tax. So they've overpaid on their, their provisional tax payment. So the, the revenue service 
owes uh, the company money, not at the end of this year, but they did at the end of the previous year. Then we see we've got our equity and liabilities. We've got a non-current liability, being a mortgage loan, some current liabilities. We're going to look at all of them later on. Let's just analyze what, what uh, is given to us here. We've got, we've got some additional information, so perhaps it's a good idea to uh, read through the additional information once we've seen what else they've given us. We also see we've got here an extract from the sta uh, financial statements, in this case, uh, a short little statement of comprehensive income. Here we've got a, a statement of changes in equity, so we know that we've basically got the statement of comprehensive income, statement of changes in equity, as well as a statement of financial position, and then some additional information. So let's just go and read through the additional information so that we can form a picture of what is uh, going to be coming up for us. Uh, first of all, they say on the uh, 31st of May 2020, 250,000 preference shares were issued at 55 cents per share. Share issue expenses of 1,150 rands were paid. Now, ladies and gents, what I always suggest, um, you know, especially if you if if you are doing a written exam, if there's a lot of in additional information, a lot of additional information, sometimes you may have 10 or 12 paragraphs. It is handy to perhaps go and indicate here already what kind of an activity does that relate to. I'll tell you why. The reason is you don't always have, in fact, you very seldom have time to spare or time to waste when it comes to any financial uh, formal. So you don't want to go and read all 12 or how many paragraphs there are. You don't want to go and read them four or five times over and over. You want to read them once, <laughs> okay? So it might be a good idea to indicate here with either uh, an O or an I or an F whether this is a financing activity, an operating activity, or an investing activity. So what do you say there? Would you say that's an F, an O, or an I? If you can type that for me, please. F, O, or I? Financing activity? F, thank you, Unin Kleba. 100% correct. Thank you, Sitembele. Also 100% correct. So we know that's a financing activity. So we can write the little F next to it, ladies and gentlemen. Then we know that we don't have to go and reread that paragraph until such time as we are actually dealing with financing activities. Let's go to the next, the second paragraph. Here they say, during the year, the following transactions took place with regards to the non-current assets and were included in the profit before tax. Okay, so we know it's included in the profit before tax. So if it doesn't relate to operations, it means we'll have to go and adjust for it. It means we'll have to go and eliminate it. But before we get there, let's just read the rest there. They say investments, which cost 62,500 rands, were sold at a profit of six. 1,225 rands. So which kind of activity does that relate to? I, F, or O? I think that gives it away a little bit. I, you're 100% correct, Mr. Lassie. Yes, you as well, Josie. Yes. So that deals with investing activities. Thank you, Akona and Dale. So you can write a little I there. So we're not going to refer when we do the main statement to that paragraph unless we get to the investing activity section. But we do know that when we do our note, we'll have to take these into account. Okay, the same with the next uh, bullet there. They say property was sold for 260,000 rands. No further sales or purchases of property were made. All you need to know at this stage, what kind of activity? I, F, or O, what would you say? You can just repeat your previous answers there, right? It is still investing activities, right? Property, remember your investing activities. Thank you, Dale. A corner. Your investing activities have to do with your non-current assets. Anything, any changes 
Thank you, Zamasi. Any changes in your current assets will be an investing activity. Okay, so let's go to, to uh, the next one. They say no equipment was sold during that. Again, that has to do with non-current assets. So again, there you can look, uh, indicate a little I. Then you see in the third paragraph, they say there were no components of other comprehensive income. Right? That doesn't relate to our statement of cash flow at all because you know when there are items of, of, of other comprehensive income, a gain on an investment or a gain on uh, a foreign exchange or a an increase in a revaluation surplus, that does not involve the flow of cash at all. So that would almost be irrelevant for us. And then we talk about the fourth paragraph here, where they say an additional short-term loan of 50,000 rands was raised during the year. So if you can just indicate for us uh, in the chat box, what would you what would you write there? What kind of activity? O, I, or F? F, thank you, Sitemela, so that. Thank you, Mr. Marcy, Akona, Jose. This is more, thank you. Uh, so that deals with financing activities, right? So we're not going to look at that paragraph again until such time as we actually reach the financing activities part of our statement of cash. Okay, so now let's go and find the information for our profit before tax uh, or that, that whole note, the cash flows note. Ladies and gents, I know I've said this quite a few times before. When you encounter a new financial statement or a new note, the best place to start is to first go and memorize this structure, right? Memorize the structure of the note or memorize the structure of that financial statement first. Then, then you can start understanding what is going on because, you know, if you haven't got a structure in mind, you've got no place to start, you know, and there's there are few things in life so awful, few feelings so awful when you're sitting in an exam room and you've got no clue where to even start, right? That's a horrible feeling. They tell me, I mustn't admit that I've actually had that twice. So let's rather say that's what I'm talking about. Anyway, so, um, so, so we must understand and we must know the structure of the note as well as the cash flow state. Okay, and we now know uh, that that note the note to the statement of cash flows. Oops, I think I've just unshared there accidentally. Let's go back there. Oh, now you should see it again. Okay, so let's uh, go to to uh, the, 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 the structure of the note. So we know that it starts with the profit before tax, right? Profit before tax for the year. We know that we can find that on the face of our statement of comprehensive income. So all we need to go and do at this stage is simply find our statement of comprehensive income. There we go. And which figure are we looking for? Profit before tax. Profit before tax. Not the profit for the period, not the total comprehensive income. I'm going to talk about why we start with that, that specific one a little bit later, right? So we're looking for the profit before tax. We see that it is 288,491. Okay, so let's go down to our note and we simply write it in there 288,491. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what we've got to do now, now we've got to convert that profit before tax, we've got to convert to an operating profit. In other words, a profit that only deals with operations, which means we will have to go and now eliminate or take out or adjust for any item that does not relate, any income or any expense, that does not relate to operations, right? So that means we now have to go to our state of comprehensive income because there we might find some income and expenses, and we also have to go and look at our notes, and not the notes, our, our, our additional information, those paragraphs there. So we'll have to look at that. Maybe let's start with our uh, uh, 
our statement of comprehensive income. Now I'm again going to ask you a few little questions, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you just need to uh, ask or answer yes or no. We see that we've got revenue from sales. Revenue from sales, right? Is that part of operations? You can just type for me yes or no. Revenue from sales, is that part of operations? In other words, does that have to do with your dealings with your customers or your uh, or your, your your suppliers? Yes, clearly it is. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, Mzimasi, Anil, Jose, Akona. Yes, it has to do with your day-to-day -day trading activities. It has to do with your dealings with your customers. So clearly that is part of operations, right? That is part of operations. So we do not want to eliminate that. We want that to stay in as part of our calculation to eventually end up with cash generated from operations. Now let's look at the, 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 the second one there. The second one, interest income. Interest income. Now there are quite a few ways that we can look at this. I'm going to take the long route, the scenic route, but I think it, it, it hopefully explains it better. Which cash flow, which cash flow is related to interest income? If you can talk for me there, which cash flow is directly related to the income called interest income? Which cash flow? Which cash flow is directly related to interest income? It will be interest received, right? So if you have if you have a, 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 an income called interest income, if you have actually received the money during the course of the year, that will be your interest received. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that interest received, when we look at the face of our statement of comprehensive uh, statement of cash flows, we saw, we said earlier that there are five categories of so-called other operating activities that are not part of your operations. Let's go through that whole list again. Remember, there are only four in this question, but I said that there's a fifth one. So let's just recap. So there are five kinds of cash flows that form part of your overall operating activities, but they are not part of the operations, right? They are not part of the operations. Those five were, let's start uh, maybe with interest received, or interest paid, or dividends received, or dividends paid, or income tax paid. So clearly interest received, the cash flow, of interest received is related to the income that we refer to as interest income. So that interest income, ladies and gentlemen, um, if I can just find it again, that interest income there, is that part of operations? Yes or no? You can talk for me there, please. Is it part of operations? A lot of yeses here. I've got a lot of yeses here. And I would rather have a lot of no's here. Let, let me just, let, let's, let's talk through that again. Let's just talk through that again. If we look at our statement of cash flows, right? If we look at our statement of cash flows, we know that our first major section is the operating activity section. Then we've got the investing activity section, and later we've got the financing activity section. But even this operating activity section, we can divide into two distinct distinct parts. The first part only deals with your operations. Operations. Maybe I must just highlight it. Right, so that deals with your operations. And the only two items, if we are using the direct method, that has an effect on your operations, are your dealings with customers and your dealings with suppliers and employees, right? That is the only ones that affect your operations. And this is the figure that's generated from operations that we are now attempting to calculate. 
And then we said this operating activities overall shed section also contains five, possibly a maximum of five other items which we've just listed a few minutes ago that are also regarded as operating activities. They're not part of your day-to-day -day dealings with customers. They're not part of your day-to-day -day dealings with suppliers and employees. So even though we do not provide a subheading, we sometimes refer to that as the other operating activities. So there are other operating activities, but they are not part of operations. So now are there any different answers? As they asked there, why no? Now hopefully you know why no. <laughs> right. They already uh, explained it perfectly there. Right. Thank you, Jose. Okay, so it is part of the operating activities section, but you must remember uh, our note ends with a description cash generated from operations. So that is what we are targeting. That is where we are working towards. So any item that is not part of the operations, we want to go and eliminate. And we know that the interest income, we can see it in front of us here. If we can just go back to the we know that the interest income is part of our statement of comprehensive income. So it is part of profit before tax, right? It is already included in profit before tax, but it is not part of operations. So therefore, we want to go and eliminate it. So let's go and eliminate it. We see that the income was 1,600. Now we've got to ask ourselves a few questions, ladies and gentlemen. When it comes to that 1,600, uh, I'm going to, to, to ask you to again type for me yes or no. I know we've, we've already answered some of these questions. That 1,600, is it already included in profit before tax? Yes or no? Is it already included? Yes. Thank you, Jose. Yes, people, we, we've, we've just said that a few a few seconds ago. It's already included in profit before tax. But it's not part of our operations. So now we want to go and take it out. So the next question we have to ask ourselves, when we included that in profit before tax, that interest income, would we have added it to our other income? Or would we have deducted it from our other income? If you can just for me there originally in our statement of comprehensive income would we have added the interest income or would we have deducted it from our income? added dale thank you Masi. thank you jose yes you would have added it thank you our corner you would have added that in our statement of comprehensive income but now we want to take it out of that profit for the year, the profit before tax figure. So if we want to take it out, what do we have to do now? Deduct it or add it back if we want to take it out? Yes, it's already been added in a writing at profit uh, before tax, and now we want to take it out. It means we have to go and deduct it, right? We have to go and deduct it. Thank you, Ms. Marcy. Right, so there we've got that first one there so the uh, interest income remember we are describing these as incomes and expenses because we haven't converted them to cash flows yet so we are going to deduct that it has already been added it's already been added and included in profit before tax but because it's not part of operations it means we want to go and eliminate it so we're going to deduct it from our profit before tax Okay, ladies and gents, let's go back to our statement of comprehensive income. The next one, on the face of our statement of comprehensive income, we've got a, a line item called other income because they haven't provided us with a profit before tax note. They also give us the nature of those items. So let's look at this one, profit on sale of investment. Profit on sale of investment, we've also seen all of these details there. They were also included in paragraph two. Doesn't matter. We can we can we can first work through our statement of comprehensive income and then we can look whether we missed anything by looking at the, the, the additional information. 
So that profit on the sale of investment, the first question we've got to ask ourselves, ladies and gents, if you can again type yes or no for me, is that part of operations? Yes or no? No, thank you, Jose. No, Mzimasi. Thank you. Right, you are all correct. In fact, it isn't even part of operating activities. It is part of what kind of activity? Profit on sale of investment. As soon as you hear investment, uh, then you know it's a non-current asset. So that will be part of what kind of activity? You can type for me just the letter, F or O. I, 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 thank you all. Thank you all. Right, so it will be part of investing activity. So it's not part of our operations. So again, we have to go and eliminate that. We have to go and eliminate that. So that's 6,205. We will go and indicate as an adjustment to our uh, uh, property for tax. There we've got it. Profit on sale of investment. And what's so high? Let me see if it down there we go so profit uh, on sale of investment 6225 now again we've got to go through the motion ladies and gentlemen that profit uh, that that profit on the sale of investments let me maybe scroll up to our statement of comprehensive income so that you can see it has it been included already in determining profit before tax Yes or no? Has it been included already? Yes, thank you, Jose. Thank you, Mzimasi. Yes, it has already been included. Right, it has already been included. But now we see it is not part of our operations because it has nothing to do with our day-to-day -day dealings and wheelings with our customers or our suppliers. It has to do with our investing activities. So that means we have to go and eliminated so let's go and uh, down to our, our note again there we go so now we've got to ask the second questions for ourselves in determining in uh, determining the profit before tax would we have added that profit on sale of investment to our income or would we have deducted it in arriving at profit before tax add or deducted initially on, our, on the face of our statement of comprehensive, add it, add it, add it. Thank you. We would have added it, right? But now we want to take it out, right? We want to get rid of that figure out of the profit. So if we want to get rid of that figure, what do we have to do now? Add it again or now go and deduct it? Right? We just, now we've got to go and deduct it, right? Because we want to take its effect out. We want to take its effect out so far good there we go thank you all so let's go back to our statement of comprehensive income there we go let's have a look at our next item our next item profit on sale of property profit on sale of property so now we've got to ask ourselves ladies and gentlemen is that part of operations yes or no is that part of our dealings with our customers and suppliers no 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 sir thank you Mrs. Morrissey all correct like Mrs. Moore said you are 100% correct in fact you know that is part of what kind of activity you probably are ready already to, to, to type that what kind of activity would that represent if it has to do with our non-current assets it has to do with our investing activities. Thank you, Mkubile, Kornam, Zimasi. Thanks as well for confirming. So that has to do with our investing activities. So again, we've got to eliminate that. We've got to go and adjust for that. So we see that the profit on sale of property was 35,000 rands. So let's navigate down to our note. That's too far. So that is 35,000 rands that we have to go and adjust for. Now we've got to ask ourselves again, like we did before, when we drew up this statement of comprehensive income, would we have added the profit on sale of property to our other incomes or would we have deducted it originally in our statement of comprehensive income? Add 
little deducted. Add it. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Akona. Thank you, Nkobile. Right, so we would have added that. Now we want to get rid of its effect. We want to take it out. So if we want to take it out, what do we have to do in this note? Do we have to add it again? Or do we now go and deduct it? Here we go. Thank you, Jose. So now we have to go and deduct it. Right. So there we have another adjustment to our profit before tax because we are trying to, to first of all, initially reach an operating profit, something that is not a cash flow yet. It's still a profit or a loss, but it only and purely and merely relates to the operations. So now let's go back again to our uh, statement of comprehensive income. Now a few trick questions. I'm going to ask you a few trick questions. Just just for fun, just for fun. The next item there, cost of sales. Cost of sales. Does that relate to operations? Yes or no? Big question number two for the day. Yes, Mzi Masi. Yes, Jose, you are on fire. You are on fire. Yes, that has to do with our inventory and and either, either the acquisition of the inventory from our suppliers, or in this case where it's cost of sales, it will be the procurement or the or, 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 or the uh, uh, the cost of the items that you sold, not the procurement, sorry, that was the sales. So this will be the cost of the items that you sold to your customers. So it has to deal, it has to do with your dealings with your customers. Let's uh, go to another little trick question. We've done that. Operating expenses, operating expenses, would that be part of your operations? Big question number three, yes or no? It is actually yes, most of you have got it right. The reason for that, ladies and gentlemen, operating expenses basically represent the suppliers or your payments to suppliers of uh, uh, services other than your inventory, right? The cost of sales would represent the, the, the inventory, but the operating expenses would be your 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 uh, telephone, you know, the amount you pay for your telephone or for your internet uh, service or for printing or for stationery and so, and even your salaries and wages, right? Your salaries, your 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 uh, your payroll. Oh, over it. There you go, Dale. Dale. Exactly. So that, that that is still to do with your operation. So that will be amounts expense on the supplies of of, of items other than, than than inventory, right? Like we said, telephone services and so forth. So that's still part of your operation. So you do not want to eliminate it. You do not want to eliminate it. Okay. So now let's go to the next item. So we've got the operating expenses. Then finance cost, ladies and gentlemen, finance cost. Does that form part of your operations? Yes or no? Thank you, Mzimasi. Thank you, Nkubile. Okay, so it doesn't form part of our operations. We have seen, perhaps we can, we can just uh, look at our, our, our main statement again. We have seen that when it comes to the face of our statement of, of cash flow, that part is with operations, but the expense, uh, which is finance cost, is very closely re related to this cash flow. Finance cost expense is very closely related to that cash flow, which is interest paid. And we see that it's not part of the operations, even though it's part of our overall operating activities, it's not part of operations operation so you are correct so that means we'll have to go and eliminate it so let's go back to our statement of comprehensive income we see the finance cost was an amount of 68,134 so let's go back to our uh, not the main statement to our, our note so here we see in our note uh, where is it Interest expense, 68,134 rands. In the second question, we've, we've, we've answered the first one, that it's not part of operations, so we need to go and adjust for it. 
The second question we have to ask ourselves now, in arriving, in calculating profit uh, before tax, in calculating profit before tax, on the face of your statement of comprehensive income, you have added the, in, uh, the interest expense or the finance cost, or did you deduct the finance cost uh, to arrive at profit before tax? Add or deduct originally in your statement of comprehensive income. We deducted it. Thank you, Akona. Thank you, Mzimasi. Thank you, Mkubile. You are all correct, as Mrs. Moore has confirmed there. So, in the, on the face of our statement of comprehensive income, we have deducted that. Now we want to get rid of it. We want to eliminate it. We want to take it out. So, what do we have to do now? Do we have to deduct it again? Or do we now have to add it back? Deduct or add back? Thank you, Mzimasi. Thank you, Nkobile. Yes, thank you. Now we've got to add it back. Remember, we want to get rid of the effect thereof. So now we have to add it back. Right, ladies and gents, that is exactly what we've done there. So we've added that back. So we've covered that one. We've covered that one. We've covered that one. Let's see if there's anything else. So we'll go back to our statement of compre uh, uh, comprehensive income. Let's see what else we have there. Let's see what else we have there. We've covered that. That gives us the profit before tax. What about the income tax expense? This is now trick question number four <laughs> or five. I can't remember now. What about the income tax expense? Is that part of operations? Yes or no? Is it part of operations? This is a real trick question. Is it part of operations? Quite correct, Leonard, uh, Lorenzo. Correct, Lorenzo. It's not part of operations. It's not part of operations, right? Let's have a look. When we look at our, the main face of our statement of cash flows, we see that the, 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 the the cash flow that is closely related to the income tax expense is something we call the income tax paid, right? And that is not part of operations, right? It is part of the overall operating activities, but it is part of the so-called other operating activities. So it's not part of operations. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, now trick question, biggest trick question so far, should we go and adjust for it? Yes or no? Should we now go and adjust for it in our note? Who says yes and who says no? This is a heavy one. No, sir, you are correct. You yeah, see that beautiful little wondering face, Ms. Marcy? But you are quite correct. Why do we not go and adjust for it, ladies and gentlemen? We've seen that it is, it, is, it is not part of operations, right? It's part of the other operating activities. So why do not, why do we not go and adjust for it? Why, ladies and gentlemen, where did we start? Yeah. That is the important thing. We started with profit before tax, right? We started with a profit before tax figure. If we, just theoretically, we're never going to do it, we're never going to do it, but theoretically, if we had started with this figure, if we had started that note with a profit for the period, then it would have meant that the income tax expense had already been deducted, and then we would have had to go and add it back, right? But now we don't have to add it back because it hasn't been deducted yet, right? We don't add it back because it hasn't been deducted yet, because we started with that figure. We started with a profit before tax, right? So that tax expense has not been deducted yet. Uh, when, when, when we start, the, the, the figure that we use to start our, our note with, so therefore we do not go and add it back. Does that make sense? Even though it's not part of the operating uh, or part of the operations, as Mrs. Moore said, we are oh, beautiful. Thank you, Mrs. Moore. And Mrs. Moore clearly states, remember, we started profit before tax. So the tax expense has not yet been deducted, so therefore we cannot go and adjust for it. Right? We cannot add something back 
if it hasn't been deducted in the first place. Okay, so now let's go back to our statement of, of uh, comprehensive income. Let's see if there's anything else. Nothing else there. So now, ladies and gents, the only thing that we might be slightly worried about is that in our operating expenses, there might be some expenses. Uh, we, we know that generally, generally it will be it'll be part of our operations, but there might be a few exceptions. There might be a few expenses in there that do not relate to our uh, uh, operation. So now we have to also go and have a look at the additional information. So in the additional information, we've already marked paragraph one with an F, so we know financing activities will, will never be adjusted for. Uh, but yeah, we've got some items marked with I's. So let's see which of them perhaps we haven't covered yet. But which of them perhaps we haven't covered yet? They say investments which cost 62,500 were sold at a profit of 6,225. We've already dealt with that, right? We've already dealt with that. Uh, you remember we adjusted for that, that, that profit on the disposal of investments. They say property was sold for 260,000. No further sales purchases of property were made. So we'll still have to go and, and work out what is the, the, the actual uh, cash flows with, re, with, with regards to the disposals or the acquisitions, right? We'll do that when we get to the face of our statement of comprehensive, uh, the face of our statement of cash flows. So ladies and gentlemen, the only other two that we can think of, or the only other possibility, uh, it, it might not be two, it might be three, it might be four, but the only group of possibilities that we can think of now that could be included in our operating expenses would be what? Would be what? What kind of expense could possibly be part of our operating expenses? That, that you do not disclose separately on the face of your statement of comprehensive income, it'll only be disclosed in the notes. Uh, depreciation, the depreciation on your various categories of assets. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we know that that is the one that, that, that we haven't dealt with yet. Now we've got a little bit of a problem. Let's see, do they tell us what the depreciation expense is? Let me start from the top. Here we've got the equipment at cost, the equipment accumulated depreciation, and the same with vehicles. So um, it's unlikely that we'll find anything to do with depreciation on the face of our statement of uh, uh, financial position. So here, yeah, do they tell us anywhere what the depreciation was? Nope, I don't see it either. Do they tell us here, yeah, anywhere, where the, what the depreciation was? Or there? you see anywhere in this question what the depreciation is, ladies and gents? Uh, if you can just type for me yes or no, because if, if, if you say yes, it is there, then I'm going to make a lot of unnecessary calculations. If it's not there, then we are going to make a lot of necessary calculations. Richard, so nowhere do they tell us what the depreciation is. Right, ladies and gentlemen, that means we are going to have to calculate for ourselves what the depreciation expense on each of those categories for the year were. Right, so we'll have to go and calculate that. Now, ladies and gents, when it comes to the statement of cash flow, we employ a little technique. A technique we're going to, going to use it and reuse it and reuse it to calculate especially cash flows. But very often, you also have to use this technique to calculate expenses like the way we are going to do now, uh, even though it's mostly to calculate your, your, your cash flows, right? So, ladies and gentlemen, that technique we call reconstruction, the reconstruction of your ledger accounts. Right? So, the reconstruction of your ledger accounts. So, the reconstruction means you are going to basically, in summary, construct what your ledger account would have looked like during the course of the year. 
So let us start with the various, uh, or the first category of non-current asset. That is the first category. Property, but we see the property does not have accumulated depreciation. It's only this, the second and the third categories. So let's go and have a look. In the case of our equipment, we've got two ledger accounts, right? We've got two ledger accounts, one containing the cost of the asset, one containing the accumulated depreciation on the asset. So now we'll have to go and reconstruct it. So uh, let's go and reconstruct perhaps the cost one first and then the accumulated depreciation for this for this particular uh, note, we only need to reconstruct the accumulated depreciation in actual fact. But eventually, when we do the face of the statement of cash flow, we'll have to go and reconstruct the cost account as well, and possibly also the, 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 the asset disposal account. So now let's just focus on this account. Equipment, cost, right? Equipment, cost. So what was the opening balance on that account? Now we must go and have a look at last year's column, right? So the opening balance was 20,000 rands. Would that opening balance be a debit or a credit balance? If you could type for me there, please. The opening balance on the cost of the asset, a debit or a credit? Thank you, Dale. That will be a debit balance, right? And the same with the opening balance next year. Thank you, Ms. Marcy. Thank you, Akona. The same would be the situation at the beginning of the following year. As Mrs. Moore says, it's an asset. Therefore, your opening balance will be a debit. Now let's go and reconstruct that account. So we're looking at equipment cost. Fortunately, we've already got them uh, just as part of our working, so let me just find them. Uh, cost, here we go, so cost. So ladies and gentlemen, we saw that on the debit side there, it had an opening balance of 200,000 rands, right? Then ladies and gentlemen, the opening balance the next year. The next year will also be a debit, right? And we've seen the opening balance which is the same as the closing balance for this year. Remember, your opening balance for next year is the same as the closing balance for this year is 240,000. It will again be a debit as opening balance. It's going to again be a debit as an opening balance. But where does that debit opening balance come from? Now you can, I'm going to use this this, the following uh, terms a lot today and a lot over the next few weeks. You're going to wake up at night screaming because you're going to hear me using these words. Where does that balance, the opening balance for the previous, for, 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 for the next year come from? It comes from the opposite side above the line, right? It comes from there. So your balance that you brought down which is still a debit balance at the beginning of the next year because it's still an asset, it comes when you have closed off this account, when you have balanced off this account, came from the opposite side above the line, right? That is where it comes from. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what you need to do is you have to balance this account off. You have to balance this account off. Now, what do we need to balance it off? On the debit side, we've got a total of 200,000. On the credit side, we've got a total of 240,000. So we add up the larger side, which is 240,000. We copy that over to the other side, 240,000. And we see our balancing figure is an amount of 40,000 rands, right? Our balancing figure is an amount of 40,000. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that can only represent one thing. If you have debited, your equipment at cost during the course of the year, what does that represent? It rep represents an acquisition, right? It represents an acquisition. And we have to accept uh, when it comes to our cash flow uh, uh, statements that all acquisitions and disposals have been done on a cash basis. So what would be our contra account? Our contra account would be the bank account. And as soon as we see that our contra account is the bank account, we know that that is a figure that represents the flow of cash. 
It represents the flow of cash. So that will have to be used on the face of our statement of cash flows. That will be part of our investing activity. We know it's an acquisition of equipment. So we've already got an item there that relates to our um, investing activities. Okay. Anyway, so like I said a, a little bit earlier, that is basically what we will have to do uh, to, to determine the acquisitions and disposals. The one that we are interested in now at this point in time is this one. The account called accumulated. Hold on. Uh, sorry, the account called equipment. <laughs> the account called equipment colon accumulated depreciation. Right. So we see at the beginning of the year. At the beginning of the year, it had a balance of 60,000. Now, if you can just type for me in the chat box there, that balance on your equipment accumulated depreciation at the beginning of the year, would that be a debit balance? or a credit balance. We often accountants refer to it as a negative. Thank you, Mzimazi. Perfect. Thank you, Mbile. Perfect. Right. So that is going to be a credit balance. It's the contract to the cost. Well, like I say, very often they also refer to to it as a negative asset, right? So that is going to be a credit balance. And then at the end of the year, which is the same as the beginning of the next year, it has a balance of 84,000. So at the beginning of the following year, it is again going to have a credit balance of 84,000 rands, right? So now let's go and reconstruct that account. 60,000 at the beginning, 84,000 at the end. So there we've got the account equipment, accumulated depreciation. The balance at the beginning of the year was 60,000 rands. And at the end of the year, which is the same as the beginning of the year, it still has a credit balance because it's still a negative asset uh, to the value of 84,000. Now you can start singing along with me. That opening balance for the next year, that 84,000, where does it come from? Where does it come from? It comes from the opposite side above the line. This is now below the line. Of the line I'm talking is the, the total, right? The totals line. This is the new year. So you have a credit balance starting the new year. Where does that opening balance come from? It comes from the opposite side above the line, right? So you have to go and insert that there in the process of reconstructing this ledger account. Okay, so now, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, we would we know if we reconstruct the account, we want it to look like what it would have looked like during the course of the year. So at the end of the year, we would have gone and closed off this account or, 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 or balanced off this account, I should say, balance sheet account. So we would have balanced it off. So again, we would see what is the largest side of the two. The largest side is the debit side. It adds up to eighty-four thousand. Copy that 84,000 over to the opposite side, right? 84,000. We've only got this opening balance on this account at the, uh, at the moment. And we see that the difference, our balancing figure, is an amount of 24,000, right? To balance this account, we have to have a credit there of 24,000. In other words, our accumulated depreciation, depreciation on equipment increased during the course of the year, right? So, ladies and gentlemen, that can only mean one thing. If you have increased your accumulated depreciation, it means you have written off depreciation expense during the course of the year, right? So, that depreciation expense of 24,000 rands would have been part of your operating cost. That would have been part of your operating cost. It has been disclosed on the face of your statement of comprehensive income. But as we know, it is not part of the operations, right? It has to do with has to do with an investing activity. So it cannot have anything to do with your operations. So that means, ladies and gentlemen, we have 
to go and eliminate it in our notes. So let's go down to our note, or upwards in this case. We go up to our note again. What is the amount? 24,000. Uh, 24,000. So we now know we have to go and eliminate that. So we've got depreciation on equipment, right? Depreciation of 24,000 rands on equipment. We'll deal with that soon. We'll deal with that soon. No problem, ladies and gentlemen. If you want, you can disclose them separately on this statement. You could have said there adjustments for adjustments for depreciation on equipment, 24,000. And then you could have had a next line which would have said uh, depreciation on vehicles, 30,000 rents, right? Doesn't matter. Or you can combine them there. Either one would be correct. What I just suggest is that if you've got seven or eight categories of, of non-current of, of, of property, plant, and equipment, then you don't want to clutter up the statement. So if you've got many categories, more than four or five, then it might be a better idea to aggregate them, to combine them. Okay, so we've dealt with that one, 24,000. Now the, the only thing we've got to ask ourselves is that second question. In determining in arriving at profit before tax, in arriving at profit before tax, would that depreciation, which is part of your operating cost, we'll just go to the uh, statement of competitive income again, it's somewhere in there. Would that have been added to your, to your uh, uh, other income or would that have been deducted from your other income, the depreciation, part of your operating cost? have been added or deducted when you are drawing up the statement of comprehensive income. Thank you, Ms. Imazi. Deducted, right? It would have been deducted. So now we want to get rid of that, ladies and gentlemen. So what do we have to do now? Not deduct it again. Now we have to go and add it back. Now we've got to go and add it back. So that will be a positive. So that would be plus 24,000 rands, right? But now we've no, we've got another category. We've got another category uh, of, of property, plant, and equipment. So let's go to our statement of financial position that carries, <coughs> excuse me, that carries depreciation for vehicles, for vehicles, right? So now let's go and have a look at the vehicles. Let's go and reconstruct the cost account and let's go and reconstruct the accumulated depreciation account. As we've said earlier, for, for, for our purposes immediately at the moment for the note, you probably only need to go and reconstruct the accumulated depreciation. But when it comes to the face of our statement of, of, of uh, cash flows, we'll have to go and reconstruct that one anyway. So we might as well do the two together while it's fresh in our memories, right? So let's go and have a look at the cost of vehicles. What was the balance at the beginning of the year? Zero, ladies and gentlemen, 2019. At the beginning of the year, zero. And at the end of the year, 180,000. So at the beginning of the year, theoretically, it would have been a debit balance, but it's a debit balance of zero. And at the beginning of the next year, it's got a, an opening balance of 180,000. Let's just go and see in our additional information whether there was any uh, vehicles purchased or sold. They say no, no sales or purchases uh, of property, no equipment was sold during the year and so forth. Okay, so now we've just got to go and reconstruct the cost. So it started the year with a zero, it ended the year with 180,000. So let's, uh, let's have a look where we would have con reconstructed that. Now we're talking motor vehicles. I can just find it. Um, looks like we're... Okay, we haven't reconstructed it, but let us let us go and do that quickly. Let me just copy a little account for us here. The reason why we haven't reconstructed it is because it's actually pretty pretty simple. Oops, no, that's not right. Pretty simple little calculation. Um, 
that's not going to work for me either. Okay. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, um, perhaps perhaps we can just talk our way through it. I don't want to mess up this this uh, answer because, as you can see, I'm also auto saving our changes. Let's maybe just talk through it then. If we but, but to reconstruct it would be better. If there are no disposals during the course of the year, which they've told us, and we see that 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 uh, we started off with a zero balance and we ended the year with a hundred and eighty thousand balance. Does that mean we have acquired a new motor vehicle? Yes or no? Have we acquired a new vehicle? Yes, thank you, Kobile. It means we have acquired a new vehicle. Thank you, Zimasi. Uh, and to the value of what? What would the, the value of that acquisition be? Hundred and eighty thousand. Thank you, Nzimasi. Thank you, Nkobile. So we know yes, so we know that would have been the acquisition. Okay. The same basically applies to the accumulated depreciation account, ladies and gentlemen. You see that the opening balance on the accumulated depreciation was zero, and the closing balance is a credit of thirty thousand. So if that Accumulated depreciation increased by thirty thousand. What would be the contra account if we increase the accumulated depreciation? It means we would have debited which account? The depreciation. Thank you, Ms. Marcy. Perfect. Right. So that means the depreciation would have been debited with. 30,000. So the, 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 the depreciation expense on vehicles, which is part of our operating cost, which, which is not part of the, the, the uh, gas generated from operations, which we must go eliminate, would therefore be 30,000. Right. So we can go back to our statement of, or the, the note to the statement of cash flows, and we see that the 30,000 has also been reversed right we know that in order to to arrive at the profit before tax figure that depreciation expense would have been deducted so now to eliminate the effect thereof it means we have to go and add it back right so we go and add it back okay ladies and gentlemen now we've covered all possibilities so now we can simply go and see what is the operating profit remember we haven't converted it into a cash flow yet uh, it is still a profit, but it's a, it is a profit that only relates to our operations. So how do we do that, ladies and gents? We take our profit for the year, we add up all our positives, we deduct all our negatives, and then that gives us the operating profit before changes in working capital. The changes in working capital, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to discuss just now. Changes in working capital, the, the, the uh, adjustment is now to convert the profit into a cash flow. So now we're going to take the profit, which is only with, uh, which, which is only with regards to our operations, we're going to convert it into a cash flow by eliminating the effects of the accrual system. Right. So now... Let's go and see where would we have uh, uh, accrued our sales and our purchases and our inventory transactions. About an hour or so ago, we've already decided it's on our inventories uh, or our, our accounts receivable or our accounts payable accounts. But I just want to go and, and just for the sake of completeness, uh, uh, give you an even better indication. If we look at our statement of financial position, Right. If we look at our statement of financial position, uh, I'm going to give you an indication now of which are the items that deal with your operations. What did we just call that that uh, little subtotal changes in working capital? So what is meant by your working capital? Ladies and gentlemen, this is an interesting little term. I guess it's a good idea for you to make a note of it. What is meant by the term working capital? The reason is you're going to encounter it in financial accounting three again. 
In financial accounting three, you're going to do more advanced uh, 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 analysis and interpretation of financial statements, and then you have to know what is meant by working capital. Working capital, ladies and gentlemen, refers to your net current asset. So it can be either a current asset or a current liability that deals with operations. Right, so your working capital, that is the, the, the current assets or the current liabilities that deal with operations. Any of those current assets or any of those current liabilities do not deal with your operations. In other words, your dealings with your customers and suppliers and employees, and it is not part of working capital. So now I'm going to ask you probably the sixth or seventh trick question. Now, if we go to our statement of financial position and we look at the current assets, the inventory, ladies and gentlemen, we just look at our current assets first and then we'll go to current liabilities. Inventory, inventory, would that be part of your operations? Yes or no? Does that have to do with your dealings with customers and suppliers? Yes, Dale, 100% correct. Right, so therefore, Yes, Mzi Masi, 100% correct. So that means that will be regarded, regarded as um, working capital, right? That will be included in your working capital. Let's look at the second one here, accounts receivable. Accounts receivable, would that be regarded as part of your working capital? In other words, is that part of your operations, yes or no? Would you say yes or no? Is that part of your operations? In other words, would that be regarded as part of your working capital? It could change and affect your your your, uh, um, your operations. And the answer is yes. Thank you, Zimasi. Yes, and you are a beautiful little face wondering, but you are hundred percent. Right, that is also part of uh, 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 working capital, so that does have an effect on your operations. Now let's look at the next one: current tax refundable, income tax. Current tax refundable, income tax. You think that is part of your working capital? In other words, does that have an effect on your operations? Yes or no? Correct, Dale. No, correct, Nkobile. Correct, right. That is part of the so-called other operating activities. We, we, do, we, we do have a uh, uh, line item called income tax paid, but it is not part of the operations. It falls below your cash generated from operations. So your current tax refundable, or if it had, if it had been under your current liabilities, it would have been called tax payable, if it had a credit balance, then that would also not be part of your, what did we call that? Working capital, right, not part of your working capital because it doesn't have to do with your operations, your day-to-day -day trading activities. Now let's go and do the same with our current liabilities, ladies and gentlemen. Let's look at the first one, the current liabilities, accounts payable. Does that have to do is, uh, let, let's maybe ask it now very, very uh, uh, structured. We want to find out whether this should be regarded as, uh, 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 forget the word now, as part of your uh, um, working capital, right? We want to find out if it's part of your working capital. It can only be part of your working capital if it's either a current asset or a current liability, which this one is and it has an effect on your operations. So does this have an effect on your operations? Yes or no? In other words, does, does it have to do with your dealings with your suppliers or employees or your customers? Thank you, Marcy. 
Thank you, Richard. Yes, it does. So that means it does have a bearing or an effect on the operations. Therefore, it is seen as working capital. Let's go to the next one. We've now identified how many, two, three so far. The inventory and the accounts receivable under assets and the accounts payable under the liabilities. Let's look at, have a look at the next one. Current tax payable income tax. Now we know that the income tax paid is under our operating activities but below the cash generated from operations. So it's not part of cash generated from operations. So would you see this as part of your working capital? Yes or no? No, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Mzi Marcy. No, so that will not be part of your working. Let's go to the next one. Short term loan. So they've either, in this case, we can see it increased from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. So they've acquired a short term loan. Is that part of your day to day operations? Yes or no? Part of your day-to-day -day operations, yes or no? Thank you, Dale. Again, no. Right. We know that anything that has to do with loans has to do with financing activities. Right. So if it has to do with financing activities, then it means what? It is not part of operations. There's one. So then, therefore, it's not seen as part of our working capital either. Then we've got another little item here, shareholders, and they've got an asterisk there, asterisk there. They say shareholders, this amount represents dividend owed to ordinary and preference shareholders. So clearly we've declared an ordinary dividend, we've declared a preference dividend somewhere during the course of the year, probably towards the end of the year, which we haven't paid yet by the end of the year. That is why we still owe that to our shareholders. Anyway, be that as it may, what we have to ask ourselves now is whether that is part of our working capital. So in order to answer whether it's part of our working capital, we have to determine, is, does that have an effect on our operations, our day-to-day -day trading activities and dealings with our customers and our suppliers? Yes or no? Thank you, Mzi Marcy. Oh, right. Thank you so much. So that means uh, your shareholders for dividends or shareholders, what you owe them, is also not regarded as part of your working capital. So now we've identified that only three items are part of your working capital. What were the three? The inventory, the accounts receivable, and the accounts payable. So now we've got to go and see whether they've increased from the beginning of the year until the end of the year. And then we've got to adjust our, our note uh, to the effect that it eliminates the increase or the decrease in the accruals uh, at the end of uh, this year as compared to the end of the previous year. OK, so let's start with our, it uh, doesn't matter where we start, let's start with our accounts uh, payable, uh, sorry, receivable. Let's start with the assets or oh, inventory. Sorry, that's right at the top. <laughs> Let's get, use the same order. So inventory, that's the first one. So we started the year with 65,600 pounds, ladies and gentlemen, and we ended the year with 73,000. So I guess there are quite a number of questions we've got to ask ourselves first. Or, or, or in order here, the first question, the easiest one of the lot. Did it increase or decrease from the beginning of the year? If you can just type for me, did it increase or decrease from the beginning of the year? The inventory that's sitting in your warehouse, the inventory that's physically in your where are we? at the end of this year, did it increase from last year or did it decrease from last year? It increased. Thank you, Mzi Marcy. Thank you, Dale. It increased, right? So at least that's a start. We already know we are going to describe it 
in that note as increase in inventory, increase in inventory. Uh, and if you can just work out for the what for, for us there, what is the increase? So it's seventy three thousand less sixty five thousand six hundred. If, if you can just, uh, it should be something four hundred rands. So seventy three thousand less sixty five six hundred. 7,400, thank you, Mzimasi. It had to be something 400 because the, it comes from a 600 to a 000. zero. So we'll just keep that in mind. If I forget, I will come back to the note here. So 7,600 is the increase. Right, so we, <laughs> no worries, Del. We all do that sometimes. So now uh, we've, we've decided that it's an increase. We've decided that the increase is to a value of 7,400 rands. So now the only the third decision, third but very important decision that we've got to take here is whether we have to show it as a positive or a negative. A positive or a negative. Now there are two ways in which you can do this. Mr. Borman actually uh, described it last week incredibly well. And I must say I haven't actually thought about it like that. Uh, until he demonstrated. So I actually also learned something from that class. So we can do it that way, and then I'll show you the, the alternative. So Mr. Borman said, if you if you reconstruct that inventory account, right, and it had a beginning and opening balance of 65,600 rands, and it had an ending balance of 73,000, in other words, it increased, it means you would have, in total, you would have debited the inventory account, right? which means that you would then have credited your bank account, right? And you know as soon as you credit your credit your bank account, it is like an outflow of cash, right? So we can clearly see that is going to be shown then as a negative, similar to an outflow of cash. The alternative way that you can have, 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 have gone through this, ladies and gentlemen, is through the reasoning is to look at what they refer to as your business cycle, your business cycle. I quite like this concept because you are going to, again, in your third year, encounter the business cycle. Then you have to understand what business cycle means anyway uh, when you do the topic of interpretation and analysis of financial statements. So the business cycle basically comes down to the following, ladies and gentlemen. When a company starts out, they have to acquire inventory, right? So they normally acquire inventory by purchasing it on credit from their suppliers. Then that inventory sits in their warehouse or their stores, right? So the inventory sits there and they eventually pay their, their suppliers. So when they pay the suppliers, the money flows out of the bank account and that money is now where? That Money is now sitting in your warehouse, right? That money is tied up in your inventory. Then what happens next, ladies and gentlemen, in your business cycle? Now you sell some of those inventories. You sell that to your customers, right? So let's assume again you sell it on credit. So some of that inventory will now be converted into accounts receivable. So where is your money sitting now? That portion of the money is sitting in your accounts receivable balance. And it is only when those debtors pay you that the money will return into your bank account. Right. So that is what we describe as the business cycle, or sometimes referred to as the operating cycle of a company. It is, there's a slight difference between the two, but for our purposes, they, they mean the same thing. So the other way that you can have, could have could have uh, logically worked through this is if you compare the end of the year balance with the beginning of the year balance, is there more of your money tied up in inventory at the end of the year or is less of your money tied up in your inventory at the end of the year? You can just type for me, more of my money is tied up in inventory at the end of this year as compared to last year. You don't have to type all that, just more or less, right? or less of my money is tied up in inventory this year compared to last year. 
more thank you mzi marcy so more of my money is sitting in my warehouse as opposed to in my bank account right so if more of my money is tied up in inventory it means less money is in the bank account so that is again similar similar to an outflow of cash if you negate the 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 you think of the accrual system it means it is similar to money leaving our bank account less money in our bank account because more money is tied up in inventory so what was that amount seven thousand four hundred we're going to show that therefore similar to an outflow so if we go down to our note here we go so we've given three things we've described it as a increase in inventories that was our first decision secondly we calculated the amount the difference between the opening and the closing balance and thirdly we had to decide is this similar to an outflow or similar to an inflow and if it's similar to an inflow we're going to show it as a positive and if it's similar to an outflow we're going to show it as a negative right. So that is the inventories and as we've already determined only those three items your inventories your trade and other receivables and trade and other payables are seen as working capital right as working capital because they relate to your day-to-day -day trading activities with your customers and with your suppliers which in turn means they have an effect on your operations Okay, so now let's go to the next one under our current assets. So we dealt with entries and now we're going to look at accounts receivable. Again, there are three little decisions that we have to make here. Our first decision is how are we going to describe it? So we have to go and see from the beginning of the year. Remember, this is the 2019 financial year. Our our comparative column this is our current year column so from the beginning of the year where it had a balance of 76,580 rand to the end of the year where it has a balance of 70,825 how are we going to describe it an increase or a decrease let's just start with that increase or decrease Thank you, Mzi Marcy. You are so wonderful today. It's just every question, and you are so polite as well. You are obviously a wonderful person. <laughs> Thank you, Mzi Marcy. So it has decreased. So now we've determined what, how we are going to describe it as, right? So the next thing we've got to decide what is the difference? Now we've got to quantify it. So we're going to take 76,580 rands. Less than 6,825. If you can just type that for me, please work it out and type it there so that we have it in the chat box. Seventy-six five eighty less seventy twenty-five, so that gives us five thousand seven hundred and fifty-five. Thank you, Mrs. Moore. Thank you, Mrs. Marcy. Right, so we've got the figure. So we've got two out of our three decisions already. Now the third decision is should we show that as a positive or a negative? Now let's go through both ways. There's a Bormans way, which I really, really liked last week, and then my, my little way. Uh, okay, so if you go and reconstruct your accounts receivable balance, you will see that you've got an opening balance which is a debit. Remember, your opening balance for an asset is a debit. So you've got an opening balance of 60, uh, uh, sorry, 76,580,000. you have got a closing balance of 70,825. So it decreased. So it means in order to decrease the, the, the opening to the closing balance, that means you would have credited the net effect of all your transactions during the course of the year would have been a net credit to that account, right? Because it's now less. It started with a debit of 76,000. 
you end with a debit of 70,000. So your total debits would be less at the end of the year. So you aggregate all the transactions that you've recorded during the course of the year would have had a net effect of a credit to your accounts receivable uh, account of 5,755, which means that the net effect, the contra of that net, net effect means you would have debited your bank account. And if you debit your bank account, it is similar to an inflow of cash. So therefore, you're going to show it as a positive. Right. You want to look at it the alternative way, ladies and gentlemen. The alternative way is at the end of this year, as compared to last year, is more or less, you can just type more or less, is more or less of your money tied up in accounts receivable. Is more money tied up in accounts receivable at the end of this year compared to last year or less? Less, thank you, Mzi Masi. So less of our money, less of our money is tied up in the debtors, in the accounts receivable. So that means the debtors have paid us better this year as compared to last year because less of our money is still outstanding. Less of our money tied up in the accounts receivable, which in turn means more of the money is available in our bank account. So again, you get the same answer. It is going to be a positive. So let's go to our note. Here we see decrease. That is our first decision. We've described it as a decrease in trade and other payables. So we're going to use exactly the same description uh, 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 as on the, on, on, on the face of the statement of financial position, trade and other receivables. But here we've got to add the description that it was a decrease in. And we see we've calculated it was 5,755. And we've seen it is similar to an inflow of cash. And therefore, we're going to show it as a positive. Right. Um, so let's now uh, I heard a thinker hand up, or well, maybe it was a message. I'm just going to go back to our uh, statement of financial position, then I'll have a look. Was there a hand raised? Somebody want to ask something? It's either a little. Uh, little wrong button or the student or maybe i've even answered the question hopefully that is that <laughs> okay ladies and gents so let us carry on looks like we're not going to get uh, to the to the main statement that but don't worry we're going to do that then next time we might just start with it today okay so now we've had a look at the we're on, we've had a look at our inventory we've had a look at our accounts receivable we know that the current tax refundable is not part of our uh, day-to-day -day trading activity, so it's not part of our, our, our working capital, keep forgetting that word, working capital, uh, and bank, that is what we are working towards, our, our, our increase or decrease in our various cash and cash equivalent accounts. So now let's go to our current liabilities. We've discussed all four of them. We've seen that only that one, only that one. Uh, can be regarded as as a. a uh, I forget that name again. <laughs> you know something that has an effect. Uh, working capital, working capital. Only that one can uh, be regarded as working capital because that's the only one that has an impact on our operations, our day-to-day -day trading activities with our customers or suppliers. So again, we've got to go through that little process, ladies and gents. We've got to ask ourselves three questions. First question, from the beginning of the year, from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, does that represent an increase or a decrease? You can type again for me, increase or decrease. Started the year, it started the year at 71,250. It ended the year at 48,175. 
So is that an increase from the beginning of the year to the end of the year? Or a, an increase or a decrease? Zimasi, you started with 71,250, you ended with 48,000. So that is a decrease, right? Exactly as Mzimasi said there, it is a decrease. Thank you, Mzimasi. So that is a decrease. So that answers our first question. We're going to describe it as a decrease. To answer our second question, now we've got to deduct the one figure from the other to see by how much did it decrease. So we've got to take the 71,250 minus the 48,175. What does that give us? We type it in the chat box so that we've got a little report there. Please. Thank you, Marcy. So that is 23,075 rands. Okay. So that is the, 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 the amount that it decreased by. Now, ladies and gentlemen, our third question that we must answer is whether we are going to show that as a positive or a negative. So let's first do the way that, that, that we did it last week, which I quite like. So let's go and reconstruct that account. So in this case, being accounts payable, will it have an opening balance that is a debit or a credit? Perhaps we can start there if you can type for me the opening balance on accounts payable. Would that be a debit or a credit? It's a liability, remember? A credit. Thank you, Mzi Mazi. It is credit right so you start with a credit balance and then at the end of the year uh, the, the 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 balance that we carry forward uh, will be on the debit side because it, in the new year we started again on the credit side so our opening balance for the next year is also going to be a credit and as we always say where does it come from it comes from the opposite side above the line so it means we end it with a balance of 48000 so if your credits decreased during the course of the year, right? Your credits decreased. It means you would have had done what with your with your uh, 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 creditors control account? You would have in total debited it, right? You would in total have debited it. Does that make sense? So then your contra account would be the bank account, right? The contra account would then be the bank account. Right, ladies and gentlemen, which means that is similar to an outflow of cash. So we are going to show this as a negative. Right. Now let's look at the alternative way. Now remember, this is a liability. This is not an asset. So the alternative way, there, there are two questions we can ask ourselves. The alternative, one of the two ways that we can ask ourselves, this is not our money that is tied up in creditors. This we must understand. It's not an asset. It's a liability. So it's not our money that is tied up in creditors. It is how much of the credit facilities being granted by the creditors have we made use of. Because the more we take make use of their credit facilities, the less we use our bank account, right? The less we use our cash. So in this case, have we made more use of their credit facilities at the end of the year compared to last year or less use of their credit facility? More or less use of their credit facilities? Less, thank you, Mzimasi. We've made less use of their credit facilities, which in turn, and this is the second way that you can, you can think about it, if we had made less use of their credit facilities, it means we have paid more money to them this year as compared to the end of last year. We owe them less, so we've paid more money to them during the course of this year as compared to last year, right? So the two ways you can think about it there, we're making less use of their credit facilities, which means we have made more use of our own money, or you can say we have paid them better uh, at the end of this year as compared to the end of last year, 
which both indicate that it is similar to an outflow, right? It's similar to an outflow. More of our money has left our account because we have paid more money to our creditors this year as compared to last year. So again, it will be similar to an outflow. So we are going to show it as a negative. All right, so let's go down to the note. The amount that you've given us there, um, what was it? 20, let me just go to the chat book. Was it 23075? 23075, thank you, Ms. Marcy. There we go. Uh, so there we can indicate it. All three questions have been answered. We describe it as a decrease in trade and other payables. The difference is 23,075 rands. And this is similar to an outflow of cash. So we're going to indicate it as a negative. So that will be 23,075 in brackets. Right, ladies and gentlemen, our next step is to go and add these three together. Because we're now also going to indicate the change in working capital. What was the change in our working capital? And then we can, if we wish, indicate whether it was an increase or a decrease. Clearly, if that is a positive, it's going to be an increase. If that is a negative, like this one is, it's going to be a decrease. In actual fact, IAS 7 is quite satisfied if you just if you just leave the word changes. In working capital so you can actually leave that as changes in working capital as well or you can improve it by indicating it's a decrease or a decrease. so we uh, add up all the positives and we deduct all the negatives that gives us a negative of 24,720 so that figure that decrease in working capital that changes that converts this profit Remember that the first number of adjustments converted our net profit into a profit that only deals with operations, right? It's still a profit. Now, by doing this, by adjusting for the increases and decreases in accruals on, on the accounts that deal with our customers and suppliers, we've converted that profit into a cash flow, right? And what do we call that cash flow? Cash generated from operations and ladies and gentlemen please this is quite important do not call this cash generated from operating activities because this is just the first section of the operating activities this is the operations part but there are still five other possible amounts that we've got to disclose under the so-called other operating activities anyway so that is how we describe it, cash generated from operations. Maybe I should highlight that as well. How do we calculate that, ladies and gents? That is simply going to be, we've got a subtotal here, a subtotal of uh, 367,800 rands, which represents our operating profit before changes in working capital, minus the uh, decrease plus the increase, in working capital, that gives us the cash generated from operations, 343,080 uh, rand. If that is a negative, ladies and gentlemen, then, then this company is in serious business because then they are running at a loss even before we look at any other kind of activity. So, ladies and gents, I uh, know that we're running a little bit out of time. I'm going to almost, I'm almost done. Uh, just this one last step, this figure now. This one, the figure together with the description, cash generated from operations 343080, we transfer that to the base of our statement of cash flows. There we see cash generated from operations 343,080 rands. Right. So at least we've got our first figure for the face of this statement of cash flows for the main body. So next time what we are going to do, we are going to calculate cash received or receipts, if you wish, from customers. So we're going to reconstruct the account on which the accruals take place in order to determine the cash flow. And then that figure is simply going to be the difference between our cash receipts from customers and our cash generated from operations. 
And then we still have to look at the so-called other operating activities, which is going to take a while. At least when it comes to the investing activities, we've already seen the acquisitions, but there might be some disposal. So we'll have to go and calculate that. Then we still have to do the financing activities. And then finally, the reconciliation of our opening and closing cash and cash goods. So that we still got to do. But we'll have to leave that for next time, which will probably be, and I'll, I'll, I'll see with Mr. Borman when he's back, uh, whether he wants to start with a new question, and then I'll carry on with this one on Monday. If he wants to start with a new one on Thursday, otherwise I'll continue with this one uh, on Thursday. Okay, we are eight minutes over time, ladies and gentlemen. Apologies about that, but still, um, I always provide for an extra 15 minutes, so this session won't end until quarter past. Are there any questions? You can type it or you can simply unmute your microphone and ask it in question, uh, in person. I think I've overspoken. Uh, then you can ask it in person. Any questions from your side? We must still do the main body. But on the note and on the philosophy and on, on the uh, uh, history, that is a good point, Mrs. Moore makes there. Given all of the information, this this is a this is a heavy topic. I must admit, it's my favourite topic in financial accounting too, but it is also the heaviest one. But because it's challenging, it's also rewarding. That is, that is normally the case. Now, the more challenging, the more rewarding. So that is why a written test is definitely preferable. It's, there's a lot of workings. As you can see, you've got it. As you'll see next time, there are many major accounts that we'll have to go and reconstruct. We reconstructed four or five today. Four we reconstructed, and two we sort of reconstructed in our heads. So six in total, but there are many more, right? Many that we still have to go and do. Any other, any questions, ladies and gents? No questions? Okay, then I think it's time for a coffee. Thank you, Mrs. Moore, for monitoring the chat box and assisting there. Thank you, students, for attending. Um, it, it, uh, you're most welcome, Kobile. I love, I love uh, presenting, as you know. Um, it takes a while for the, for, the, uh, for the recording to process on Blackboard. That's about 40 minutes. Then it takes me about half an hour to download, but my internet, when it comes to uploading, is very slow. And it takes me about three hours. It takes three hours from when I start the upload until it actually is on Blackboard. So again, the estimated time of arrival, I would say, would be around about 5 o'clock, 5.30, then it will be on Blackboard. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Mrs. Moore. All of you have a lovely afternoon.